We've all heard the phrase Sat Chit Ananda, and we've all discussed what that means. Sat Chit Ananda is the Sanskrit phrase that is said to best describe the self that we are, the, the nature of the self that we are. And the Hindus have said for thousands of years that the nature, the true nature of self is Sat Chit Ananda, which means existence, consciousness, bliss. That that's, that's our irrevocable, incorruptible, essential nature. Those three qualities, right? So I want to give you a personal story on the first time I connected to this truth unknowingly because it's not enough to just say being consciousness bliss. Oh, that's my nature. Yeah. We have to, we have to actually understand why that's true. Why it's not just, Oh, that sounds nice. I kind of wish my nature was just being consciousness bliss. So I'll agree with that. Sounds like a nice concept. That's not quite enough to see the real power of the truth that your nature is Sat Chit Ananda being consciousness bliss, that these three qualities cannot be removed from you. There's no trauma. There's no experience. There's no loss of anything that could remove a trace of your foundational essential nature, existence, consciousness, and bliss. So when I was 23, I had just come out of the church. I had, as most of you know, in that story arc, uh, left the church, kind of left my religion and moved back to Oklahoma to just seek, seek the truth, find answers to what do I believe now about reality? Because my whole life up to that point was religion and religion is very much a, uh, a framework for what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of myself, God? What is our relationship? I wanted answers to those questions. So I started digging into Eckhart Tolle, Alan Watts, and studying loosely some of the kind of entry enlightenment teachings. And one day, uh, I'm not sure how this happened exactly, but I, was, I had my laptop open kind of in the kitchen area. I was probably making food or something, but I was home alone and a Rupert Spira video came on. And I'd never seen Rupert Spira, but it was just in the algorithm. His video came up and it was just him, you know, talking about the, the Advaita Vedanta teaching that our nature is pure awareness. I am pure awareness. I had never heard these teachings a single time in my life up to this moment. I had never heard the idea that I am awareness or even to really notice that awareness is a thing, that it is a quality that can be recognized. I had no notion of that up to this point in my life. So I'm listening, I, I walk back to the laptop and I just start listening to Rupert and he's just saying, he's going through that usual kind of self inquiry process of, can your awareness ever be absent during an experience? And he just sits there in silence. And I'm like, I, I, I guess not. Interesting. Uh, does awareness itself ever get changed or stained or altered by an experience or is awareness just always aware of whatever's arising? I was like, yeah, that's true. I can see that in myself. And he went through probably three more of those kind of self inquiry questions. And I, I loved the idea so much. My, my being resonated and vibrated with this concept. You are being itself, right? You are awareness itself, that which is prior to thought even thought you're aware of that. So you're before thoughts. I had never heard such a thing. And it was like the most beautiful music I've ever heard, the most beautiful melody. And I couldn't get it out of my heart. And that left me in a kind of blissful, peaceful, kind of liberated state, not to the same degree as the 27 year old experience that was two weeks long, but just this really light kind of felt sense of freedom on the inside for at least a couple of days, two or three days. And I know because I started wanting to tell everybody in my life, the people closest to me about this understanding and stuff. I should have just kept it silent inward to myself and just enjoyed it. Right. But nevertheless, that's what happens when we have a spiritual awakening. And I didn't know it was a spiritual awakening. I didn't see it as that at all. 
it literally just felt like a really great idea that really inspired me to feel free and happy and gave me a sense of, of the meaning of reality that I hadn't had before. And so there it is, right? Being consciousness bliss, meaning the awareness of being is bliss when it's organically felt. But the thing is, I didn't have a concept back then of being or consciousness or bliss. I didn't have any ideas of what those things meant yet. They were words that I didn't use as a Christian. So the Sat Chit Ananda, the idea you are pure awareness was fresh and organic and childlike to me. It was my first exposure to that truth and it was felt as this whew, blissful realization. How blissful it is to know that I am existence itself. That if I exist, I am existence. If I am conscious, I am consciousness. And that knowing equals bliss, but then the bliss is the third component of our nature because to know yourself is bliss means you're always bliss. You are bliss, right? But it has to be connected to in through the mind somehow because our spirit already knows who we are. Our spirit's not confused. It, the mind is the one that doesn't know and needs to be shown, right? So it's like, what's behind your conditioning? What's behind that external outward self you're always projecting? The ego self, right? <clears throat> My relationships to people, the roles that I play, the things I desire, uh, the functions I fulfill in life, that's my outer self. What about my inner self, right? What's before all that conditioning? Because really, if we just kind of take a step back and look at our persona of what we are, the things we love, the things we fear, the things we want, the pain we hold, it's all conditioning really, right? It's all just the way that life has uniquely conditioned this mind-body unit. All of us carry slightly different conditioning because we're all living out slightly separate lives, different lives, right? And they appear to be separate, but they're not because it's the one life that's living everything simultaneously. Like a mycelium network through the, through the dirt, right? Millions of branches going everywhere, but it's really just one intelligence happening. It's just the intelligence of the mushroom. So that's what you're like, right? Behind all the outward conditioning, there is a deeper dimension of who you are. But you have to discover that dimension. And the more spiritual concepts we have, unfortunately, the harder it is to connect with being consciousness bliss, right? The less fresh that understanding is, I am, I am, I am that I am. If, if connecting to the knowing that you are the actual principle itself, I am. Not the thought about I am, not even your felt experience of I am, but the I am itself, that, that, that conscious knowing principle is you. If that doesn't provoke some kind of reaction in you, peace, relief, bliss, then you don't know it yet. Yeah, so you need to practice knowing it. And so today's conversation, I want to focus on something a bit unique in this conversation, which is the importance of intensity of practice, cultivating more intensity in our devotion. The quality of intensity accelerates the spiritual progress exponentially. It is by far the most significant and many masters would say, which I would also agree with is the most important factor to when you awaken and how fast you awaken. How bad do you want it? How much do you really desire to be free of the false ego sense and all the suffering it creates? And how desperately do you burn to know reality as it is? To know the self that you are as you really are. We've heard it said, he who desires to know the true self more than his next breath instantly attains liberation. So how do we, so if this quality of desire, the intensity of desire is so important, how do we cultivate it? That's what I want to talk about today. There's a story I love with Krishna visiting with two devotees under a tree that believe a lotus tree. And one of the devotees asks 
Lord Krishna. Lord, I feel as though I am very close to liberation. Please tell me how many more lifetimes that I require. And this devotee was um, one who felt he had made a lot of progress, that he was very dedicated, and so surely this is my last lifetime, right? And Lord Krishna turns to him and says, yes, you've made great progress. You have two more births before liberation. And the devotee is like devastated, right? <laughs> He's like, no, two more rounds of this? Oh. And then the other disciple says to Krishna, Lord, how, much, how many more births must I take before liberation? And he was newer to the spiritual path than the other devotee, so he had less of that pride of the seeker and pride of the spiritual aspirant. Uh, he was more organic, yeah, in his approach. And so Krishna says, Ah, yes, you, you too shall attain liberation, but only after as many more births as there are leaves on this tree. And so the devotee looks up at the tree and sees, you know, a few hundred leaves on the tree. And his heart erupts with happiness and gladness and says, Oh, that is such wonderful news, Lord, for I shall surely be liberated at some point in the future. Just knowing that is all I need. And just as he said that, a great wind blew past where they were sitting and blew every single leaf off of the tree. And as the last leaf twirled to the ground, as soon as it touched the grass, the story says the devotee realized the self. And that story shows that the purity of our desire is like the most important ingredient because the, the second seeker or devotee was newer to the seeking journey, but attained liberation much faster. What's the, the principal difference? I mean, this guy had been doing his spiritual practice, y'all, for quite a while, very diligently. He's a very good student. He was practicing, but this guy desired it more and, and attained it. That's what is to be gained from focusing on increasing the intensity of our devotion and our desire to know truth. Taking that concept, that understanding, let's look at the awakening process as what is actually awakening? Where, where do we need to apply all that intensity? Where does that intensity go to cause change to happen? And the answer, of course, is the mind, right? The mind is what needs all that intensity of seeking because only the mind awakens because only the mind is dreaming. This is basic ACIM. The law of one validates this as well. All healing is really in the mind. The spirit of what we are is already eternally spirit. But the mind, which is one with that spirit, has forgotten, has fallen asleep, and is under the spell of forgetfulness in the dream world, where it thinks it's just a finite character called Aaron. So the mind is what's awakening, which means our intensity of practice, of devotion, needs to be aimed at the mind to cause change. Most of you know that I used to be a personal trainer. And I competed in CrossFit and bodybuilding for many years. So I had a lot of experience with this topic of how do I cause muscle growth and strength increase? And I, after years and years of very bad training, I thought I was doing great at the time, but I was, I was way, 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 way over training, uh, way too many hours of training, way too many reps and sets and met cons and things. And I was kind of burning myself out and over training. And I eventually began to figure out more, more so when I got into bodybuilding that the, the science of muscle growth is really about the intensity of the stimulus that you place on the muscle and not necessarily the volume of repetitions. Meaning there's kind of two training styles in the bodybuilding world. One style is people who love to work out six days a week and be in the gym for two hours straight and do like 20 sets of workout and just leave the gym feeling like their body has just been destroyed and hit by a truck. <laughs> and then go try to eat 6,000 calories for a few days. The other um, sort of regiment of training was very much the opposite. It was like, no, 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 volume doesn't matter in terms of causing muscle growth the intensity of the stimulus on the muscle matters and then giving the muscle lots of time to recover. Because when you put a huge stimulus on a muscle, it's gonna need at least a few days to recover back to its normal levels. 
And then if you want that muscle to grow larger, you have to give even more time for it to grow. Otherwise you kind of cut off the recovery process and the body will just repair what has been torn down because that's kind of a survival need, but it's not gonna give you the luxury of growing a larger muscle without lots of rest in between. And then again, applying that intense stimulus. So my training cut down to eventually, you know, four days a week and then three days a week. And these days it's more like two days a week because it's so clear that all that is required is an all out maximum effort to put a stimulus on the ner nervous system there needs to be an increase of strength here and then take time away. So the mind, because the mind is what's awakening, we could say the mind is like a muscle we're trying to build in that it really isn't just about trying to do all these very mundane spiritual practices all day, but like, can you give the mind such a potent stimulus that it can't not reorient itself in some way? And that is where the trauma conversation comes in. Remember I said, we're gonna talk about how trauma ties into today's teaching. Here it is. Trauma shows us something very important, very important about the nature of the mind, what the mind is capable of, let's put it that way. So what does, put it in the chat, what's something important along these lines that trauma shows us about the mind? I know you guys are thinking. <laughs> okay, good. So we're getting on the right track now. So what trauma shows us about the nature of the mind is that the mind can be impressed with an intense stimulus. You see where I'm going now? Trauma causes an immediate reorientation of the mind because it's an impression the mind can't refuse to acknowledge it demands a change to take place so if let's let's use the word impression now rather than trauma so the mind can be impressed true is there such a thing as a positive trauma then where we could positively impress the mind to the same degree that a trauma negatively impresses the mind and of course the answer must be yes, because we live in a polarized universe. Yeah, you guys are tracking, I love it. So you see where I'm going now, right? What would be the positive counterpart of trauma? Put it in the chat. Spiritual awakening, Melanie got it. The positive version of a trauma is a spiritual awakening. Now why? because what is the message being sent to the mind in a trauma? Why does the mind make such a clear reorientation immediately? It doesn't, does, you don't have to get traumatized a hundred times before a defense mechanism is built. It's right away defense mechanism. Well, the message you're sending to the mind is you've got reality wrong, right? Reality is more dangerous than you thought. So be protected, be safe. It's this instant total recognition. Oh, reality is fe more fearful than I thought, more dangerous, more threatening than I thought. And so part of our psyche closes off to that part of reality because it's afraid of it. It's afraid of that stimulus and that feeling. So a positive impression would be awakening because what a spiritual awakening is saying, the message a spiritual awakening sends to the, the mind is you've got reality wrong. Reality is much more wonderful, much more beautiful and infinite and eternal and epic than you previously thought. You've been walking in a dream essentially, right? You've been in a delusion that you live in a bad, scary universe and a spiritual awakening when we, for example, have a felt sensed experience of oneness, a mystical moment, <gasps> the curtain is pulled back and we're admitted into another realm and it's absolute pristine unity and perfection and harmony and wholeness everywhere. When, when you have that experience, you're sending an intense stimulus to the mind that says you had reality wrong. It's way better than you thought. It's way safer than you thought. It's way more loving than you thought. 
And that's why spiritual awakenings leave impressions on people. That's why at the highest end of the spectrum of uh, the intensity of a spiritual awakening, people are left in that state, sometimes permanently, because the mind cannot forget what it has seen, because the intensity of stimulus was great enough. So it's the intensity of stimulus that reorients the mind, not necessarily the frequency of stimulus. Meaning better to do one practice with every fiber and cell of your being than to do a hundred practices half-heartedly just because you're hoping to get some results because you're so wearied by your suffering. What do I do? I've tried everything. Let's just meditate on I am for a week. Waste of time, right? Better to focus on how do I increase the intensity of how I can want this? How do I, if I don't want it bad enough yet, how do I want it more? How do we cultivate intensity of desire? And so frequency in that sense only becomes important after intensity, meaning it's not that frequency isn't important or plays a big part in the awakening process. It's that until a certain level of intensity is there, you're going to get more bang for your buck just focusing on intensity. Want it more. Realize the foolishness and futility of the way you're living. See the embarrassing nature of your ego over and over that all it is is prideful and arrogant and uncomfortable to live with as a persona and you want to be rid of it already. Can you cultivate more of that? Well, if you can, then you can start applying more frequency to these practices. But guess what? It's going to happen naturally because the more you want it, part of the intensity of your desire will show up as frequency, meaning you'll just be thinking about I am all day because you want it that bad. And so as the mind is continually impressed with, you know, the truth of reality, the truth of self, it, it will gradually discard the old model and upgrade to the new model because it's going to, it's going to start seeing that the ego model, third density consciousness is a very inaccurate, outdated model now. And the mind will always go where it perceives the value is always but you got to show it where the value is. And that means we have to actually practice connecting to that being consciousness bliss, Sat Chit Ananda, right? You got to prove to the mind that its model is inaccurate before it's going to change its model. And we do that by impressing the mind with an intense stimulus. So what I want to give you now is what are some techniques to practically apply more intensity to your practice of devotion? because I know you guys are probably thinking like, well, what does that actually look like though? And so we talk a lot about how devotion is that spontaneous turning of the, of the mind towards God throughout the day. How devoted you are is how often you think of your beloved. Eventually, a total devotion to the beloved, call it God, call it I am, call it source, whatever you wanna call it, an intense devotion to that Will eventually become an abiding felt sense of self meaning you'll love it so much you can't and don't want to forget it no part of you wants to forget it and that's really enlightenment right so whenever we talk about effort intensity uh, that conversation the question always invariably arises how much does grace affect this though right i've, I've heard enlightenment is an act of grace and nothing more and then some others say enlightenment is, is your own self-effort and how bad you want it and how much you desire it. So aren't those in contradiction and, and how do we reconcile that? So the truth is that they're both true, equally true, but looking from different perspectives, right? The, the self-effort intensity of desire is looking from, or let's say speaking to the relative perspective that I'm a person on a journey and et cetera. The absolute perspective is what is true from reality's perspective down. And from that perspective, there is no journey. It's already finished, right? And so everything, all actions are gods from the absolute perspective, meaning the, the journey of seeking, the desire one has to seek, the ways they seek, it's all God. God's doing all of that. God's playing itself out through every character. There's just one being. That's the absolute perspective. And so from that perspective, we say, yeah, enlightenment is just an act of grace. When the true self within begins to wake up from its slumber of 
forgetfulness, when the true self begins to awaken from the dream, we call that enlightenment or spiritual awakening. And it's just what the true self was doing, right? The ego is not poking the self awake or the ego can't do anything. It's not even a real entity. It's just an activity in the brain. So the ego is not awakening. The self is awakening. So that's all happening by grace, right? There's no ego who's doing the awakening. So it means all the desire you possess for awakening has been given to you by God. It's God in you, living you. But with the, per, the relative perspective, we have to use a different analogy. And I always like to use the rocket ship analogy. If a rocket ship is going to leave the Earth's atmosphere, the atmosphere represents your mind, the egoic mind, identity. It's very dense with gravity, right? There's a lot of gravity in the, under that atmosphere. And so we're always being pulled back into ego consciousness. So how do we escape through the atmosphere of ego consciousness and into space, pure consciousness? Well, we need a lot of freaking rocket fuel. <laughs> we got to pump that rocket up, don't we? We have to make it basically a controlled explosion in a certain direction to have enough energy to penetrate out of that atmosphere. And so to that perspective, we say, you must increase the intensity of your desire. If you don't desire freedom bad enough, the ego will keep letting you, making you settle for the mundane, the repetitive, the same old boring ego consciousness. It's gonna keep pulling you back down to earth, yeah? So we need desire. We need an intensity of desire to get us out of the atmosphere. So here's, here's two ways of doing that. If you don't feel like you have that level of desire, before you start these practices, the question is, do I need to first cultivate more intensity before I start these practices? Or are there practices that can help me cultivate intensity? And it's sort of both and, but let's look at the second one, that there are practices, there are techniques we can do if we apply our energy to them a certain way that will definitely increase the intensity of our desire. And that's important because intensity also brings grace because from the absolute perspective, it is God doing everything, right? God is awakening in you. You're not awakening in God. So from that perspective, intensity on this plane, if they're like inversions of each other, like a coin, intensity on this side is grace on this side. So if you, if you practice building the intensity of desire, you're going to attract more grace to you, meaning that awakening process will begin to unfold much faster, much more effortlessly and naturally. And it actually starts to feel like enlightenment is serving you and waiting on you hand and foot, giving you all the lessons you need, just giving you all the gems that you need. And that's, that's the, the flow we want to be in, right? Where the awakening is just has an, an inertia of its own. And I don't have to do any practices to create or keep up that inertia. In fact, the inertia makes me do more practices. I just think about God all day. I just worship God all day. I just serve others all day because I've got so much love in my heart. There's no more room for it. I got to give it. That's the inertia we want to get to because that's really the fourth density state. So one of the ways we can do this, one of the powerful ways to increase intensity and devotion is fasting. And I want to also preface this, that this conversation, this practice, this understanding of practice is not necessarily for everyone right now because everybody's at a different phase. Just like, you know, I was a personal trainer for eight years. If I, if I had a new client, a lot of times I would get a um, software engineer, never touched a weight in his life. And so I would teach him how to lift weights and we would start with beginner level workouts. I wouldn't give a brand new personal training client a super intense all out training stimulus, right? That's reserved for later when someone's more advanced and has a little foundation underneath them. So the same is true for this practice, meaning if, if what I'm saying to you makes you feel expanded on the inside. If you get excited to this conversation, then you are ready for it. That's the only indication you need. But if this conversation makes you feel contracted or stressed out, or it makes you feel guilty and unworthy, like any feelings like that, 
that this conversation provokes means that you're probably not ready for this practice yet. Like just keep doing what you're doing. Just keep doing what's working for you now. We'll worry about intensity later. Let's just get a basic meditation practice going. Yeah, let's just get a little momentum going in, in devotion. What is devotion? How do I live with devotion? Let's get the basics down first and then we can start ramping things up. So either way that you feel about this conversation is totally valid, but that's just a caveat I wanna give that not everyone feels obligated to add these things into their spiritual practice right now. So technique number one, fasting. This is why fasting has been a very um, long lived spiritual tradition throughout all of human history. We look back to cultures 5,000 years ago and see that fasting was part of their spiritual practice. Uh, the Essenes, which is where Jesus, the community Jesus was born in, were regular fasters. And uh, Ramadan, as we know, in the is Islamic religion is um, a, a very long fast. And the, the spiritual purpose of a fast is to say, okay, if I want to desire God more than the material realm, then I'm gonna give up something really important to me on the material realm and put all that energy to God instead. So I'm gonna basically lay down this attachment on the altar to God and give it up as an act of worship. And food is one of the best ways to do that because the body wants food a lot. And especially if you're eating very unhealthy, the food cravings are gonna be very intense, which shows the kind of karma that's being purged from past actions, yeah? So fasting is a deliberate way to prioritize spiritual practice. As Jesus said, my food is to do the will of God. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. And God's will is that you know yourself. So to really do God's will is to realize God in yourself, to realize yourself as God. That's the greatest act of worship you could give to the creator is to say, ah, oh, I see it now. Only you exist. Nothing else at all exists. I am that. What greater statement of allegiance could you ever give to God? As long as you're introducing a separate self anywhere, you're accusing God of not being all powerful, right? You're saying something other than you exists, God. There's another power beside your power. But in the real universe, there is no other power. We are resting in one power. And so when I realize God in myself, when I realize myself as God, that is doing God's will. So when we, when we fast and we, we abstain from eating food for a period of time, it's gonna provoke a lot of that craving for the material, craving for the physical, the, the finite, the transient. I, I need food, I need to fill this craving with food. And so we purposefully allow ourselves to go through that feeling so that it can be a powerful reminder of what I really want. Every time I feel a food craving, I'm gonna say, oh, that's right, I want God more than food. My food is to do God's will. My food is to realize God in myself. That's the way to do fasting as a very powerful practice to increase your, the intensity of your seeking because Anytime you're up against a potent stimulus from the mind, meaning when the mind's really coming at you with a fish hook that it wants you to bite on so it can get your energy and your attention, whether it's a craving and you're like, oh man, I just want a cigarette so bad, or a food craving, or whether it's um, an old story your mind wants you to think about and go, I can't believe they did that. That was so wrong of them. It's a fish hook of some kind. And when the mind really puts a, uh, tempting fish hook in front of you to be up against that intensity of the mind and not give in is like the inverse of putting an, an intense stimulus on the mind. Meaning the mind is putting a really intense level of energy at you and you're doing uh, uh, judo basically and using the mind's energy against it and saying, not me and letting the energy go without response. It's like the inverse of the intense stimulus. So that's also a way to increase intensity. So it's like, yeah, let yourself feel those hunger pangs and continue to turn your heart to God every time they happen. When you do that, you're putting that intense stimulus on the muscle of the mind. You're sending a powerful message to the mind and the mind will begin changing and reorienting. And especially the more consistently you do that, 
the faster it reorients. So another way that we can use fasting as a means to increase the intensity of our self-inquiry is allow those hunger pains to come and then say, who's feeling this hunger? Like who really, who's the feeler of hunger? Who is hungry? And you know that the response is I am. So what is that I? There's an I behind the hunger that the hunger is trying to go towards. What is that I? That's consciousness. What is the am of I am? That's existence, that's being. So can you use hunger as a means to go, who's hungry? I am. Oh, I am. That's right. Remember, I am every time you're hungry. The I is feeling the hunger. The hunger is not what I am. I am is prior to hunger. Before hunger, there is I am. After hunger, there's still I am. I am never comes and goes, but hunger sure does. So hunger is very transient in comparison. So I'm not the hunger. I am that. I am consciousness. I am being itself. That's another way we can use fasting to really devote all day long to this practice. And some of you know, I do this every Saturday. I do a 24 hour fast and I don't like announce this or anything, but it's part of the practice is when I feel hunger, inquire who is hungry, who's, who's craving is this? And just remember, oh, I, there's an I behind all of that. And then connect to that, right? Be aware of the consciousness that is the origin of that thought. And then just be that consciousness. That's the I am state. That's the practice of I am. And when you fast, it's like you're saying, I'm taking a hiatus from my life, my busy ego life, and I'm going to use all the energy today for spiritual practice because that's how bad I want it. See, it doesn't even matter if you're feeling a huge amount of desire while you do it. It's just that you wanted it bad enough to do it, right? The doing, the action in time and space shows the most powerful message to the universe. This being wants it, and that's what attracts the grace. So it's like, yeah, you may feel low. You may feel like you're in a low vibration. Maybe you're struggling with depression right now, and you're like, I'm too depressed to focus on increasing my intensity for God. But you're not because you just have to do it, right? Just meaning just spend one day fasting and Use the fast to practice connecting to the truth of I am. And you don't even need to feel anything. You don't need to have an experience of it. Just the fact that you try to do it's good enough. Just the fact that you want to do it is good enough. And even if you're just connecting with the thought of I am, at least the thought of I am is pointing you down the right street, right? The right direction. And eventually the, the thought of I am will start to connect you to the reality of I am. So it's, it's good no matter what is what I'm saying. As long as you just want to apply yourself to the practice enough that you will take a 24 hour fast or a 36 hour fast or whatever, just the fact that you're actually doing the fast itself means part of you does want it. There is a place beneath the suffering, the spiritual heart center that says, I am awake and I want it. I do want it. And you're in touch with that part of yourself. Even if you can't feel it tangibly, you're connected to it. And so that's why you're doing the fast. So if you didn't want it at all, you wouldn't, you definitely wouldn't be doing a fast, right? No one deliberately deprives themselves of food unless they think there's a benefit to it, whether physical or spiritual, right? So who is hungry? Who's feeling this? I'm feeling it. Oh, I am. That's your pointing you to yourself, but then actually be the, I am actually go, oh yeah, I'm, I am nothing to do. Abide as it, enjoy it. Oh, how blissful to be pure awareness to be pure being. It's that simple. It's, it's simpler than childlike. And it's so simple. We overlook it. Just connect to I am now technique. Number two, very similar to fasting is extended periods of silence. Silence is a kind of fast from speaking from ego. And one of the most primary ways ego acts through the body is through the mouth, through talking out, expressing to others, its stories, its identities, its beliefs. So if we take an extended day of silence, let's say, Hey, every Saturday I take a day of silence or whatever it is for you. Remember how I said we have that external self and we need to point our energy to the inner self earlier. This is one of the ways we do that radically is we take a day of silence or a week of silence 
And you're basically saying, I'm going to disavow the whole external self, right? Because without talking about who you are as an ego, the roles you play, the identities you have, the things you desire to possess, if you can't talk about any of that, ego doesn't have a whole lot of room to express. Very little room left, right? So you're deliberately disavowing the external ego self and turning your attention to the inner self, the, the, the pure being. And so as we do that, this practice is called Mauna in Sanskrit, which means silence. The practice of Mauna is making an intentional demonstration. Hey, universe, my desire is to know the inner self. So much so I'll give up speaking for it or I'll give up eating for it. I'll lay down any treasure to have the truth. Please just give me the truth. That's what the, the relative perspective needs to do. It needs to cry out to God with your, with your whole heart and being. I mean, if you get to the point where you just cry when you think about how bad you want God, God is a second away, truly. God, the universe, source, creator, cannot resist a heart that desires truth because that is God waking up, right? So Mauna, intentional silence, is putting all my, my attention on the inner self. And so as I'm taking a day of silence, I'm gonna be within today. I'm gonna to look within today. I'm gonna to just practice, ah, oh, I am, I am, I am. Nothing to do, no one to prove anything to, no great task to accomplish, no burdens to be escaped. I'm already that, I'm already free. I'm already the eternal self. Can you just be with that recognition all day long as you stay silent and you're keeping your energy inwards? That is a very intense stimulus on the mind, isn't it? I mean, to deny the mind of being able to speak out its thoughts, that's intense enough of a stimulus by itself. But then when you also turn the mind towards I am, towards truth, and make it look at it all day, that is what puts that impression we talked about where the mind says, I've got to radically reorient here because this understanding of reality as one is so much more superior. It feels much better than my old model of separation. And so the mind will begin to discard it. 